Picture a ghost ship adrift in the vast expanse of the Atlantic, its crew vanished without a trace. The Mary Celeste, a vessel that sailed into legend, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions and speculation. A mist-laden morning in 1872, the Atlantic Ocean shimmering under the rising sun, as a brigantine set sail from New York Harbor, destined for Genoa, Italy. This vessel, the Mary Celeste, would soon etch its name into the annals of maritime lore, becoming synonymous with mystery and the unexplained. The Mary Celeste, a stout and seaworthy ship under the command of Captain Benjamin Briggs, embarked on a routine voyage carrying a cargo of denatured alcohol. Little did they know, this journey would lead to an enigma that would baffle investigators for generations to come. One fateful day, a British brigantine, the De Gratia, sighted the Mary Celeste adrift in the Atlantic. Expecting a friendly encounter, the crew of the De Gratia boarded the seemingly abandoned vessel, only to be met with an eerie and confounding sight. The Mary Celeste was eerily empty. The crew, including Captain Briggs, his wife, daughter, and the ship's crew, had vanished without a trace. Yet the ship remained intact, sails partially set, food and provisions untouched, as if the crew had hastily abandoned ship. Speculation ran rampant. Theories arose, from piracy to sea monsters to explain the disappearance. However, no signs of foul play were found. The mystery deepened, and the story of the ghost ship, the Mary Celeste, was born. The Canadian brigantine de Gratia found her in a disheveled but seaworthy condition under partial sail and with her lifeboat missing. The last entry in her log was dated 10 days earlier. She had left New York City for Genoa on November 7th and was still amply provisioned when found. Her cargo of alcohol was intact and the captain's and crew's personal belongings were undisturbed. None of those who had been on board were ever seen or heard from again. Mary Celeste was built in Spencer's Island, Nova Scotia and launched under British registration as Amazon in 1861. She was transferred to American ownership and registration in 1868 when she acquired her new name. Thereafter, she sailed uneventfully until her 1872 voyage. At the salvage hearings in Gibraltar following her recovery, the court's officers considered various possibilities of foul play, including mutiny by Mary Celeste's crew, piracy by the De Gratia crew or others, and conspiracy to carry out insurance or salvage fraud. No convincing evidence supported these theories, but unresolved suspicions led to a relatively low salvage award. The inconclusive nature of the hearings fostered continued speculation as to the nature of the mystery, and the story has repeatedly been complicated by false detail and fantasy. Hypotheses that have been advanced include the effects on the crew of alcohol fumes rising from the cargo, submarine earthquakes, water spouts, attack by a giant squid and paranormal intervention. After the Gibraltar hearings, Mary Celeste continued in service under new owners. In 1885, her captain deliberately wrecked her off the coast of Haiti as part of an attempted insurance fraud. The story of her 1872 abandonment has been recounted and dramatized many times in novels, plays, and films, and the name of the ship has become a byword for unexplained desertion. In 1884, Arthur Conan Doyle wrote J. Habakkuk Jeffson's statement, a short story based on the mystery, but spelled the vessel's name as Marie Celeste. The story's popularity led to the spelling becoming more common than the original in everyday use. The keel of the future Mary Celeste was laid in late 1860 at the shipyard of Joshua Dewis in the village of Spencer's Island on the shores of the Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia. The ship was constructed of locally felled timber with two masts and was rigged as a brigantine. She was carvel built, the whole planking flush rather than overlapping. She was launched on May 18, 1861, given the name Amazon, and registered at nearby Parsboro on June 10, 1861. She was owned by a local consortium of nine people, headed by Dewis. Among the co-owners was Robert McClellan, the ship's first captain. 
for her maiden voyage in June 1861, Amazon sailed to five islands, Nova Scotia, to take on a cargo of timber for passage across the Atlantic to London. After supervising the ship's loading, Captain McClellan fell ill. His condition worsened. The Amazon returned to Spencer's Island where McClellan died on June 19th. John Nutting Parker took over as captain and resumed the voyage to London, in the course of which Amazon encountered further misadventures. She collided with fishing equipment in the Narrows off Eastport, Maine, and after leaving London, ran into and sank a brig in the English Channel. Parker remained in command for two years, during which Amazon worked mainly in the West Indies trade. She crossed the Atlantic to France in November 1861, and in Marseille was the subject of a painting, possibly by Honoré de Pellegrin, a well-known maritime artist of the Marseille school. In 1863, Parker was succeeded by William Thompson, who remained in command until 1867. These were quiet years. Amazon's mate later recalled that, we went to the West Indies, England, and the Mediterranean, what we call the foreign trade. Not a thing unusual happened. In October 1867, at Cape Breton Island, Amazon was driven ashore in a storm and was so badly damaged that her owners abandoned her as a wreck. On October 15th, she was acquired as a derelict by Alexander McBean of Glace Bay, Nova Scotia. Within a month, McBean sold the wreck to a local businessman who, in November 1868, sold it to Richard W. Haynes, an American mariner from New York. Haynes paid $1,750 for the wreck and then spent $8,800 restoring it. He made himself her captain and, in December 1868, registered her with the collector of the Port of New York as an American vessel, under a new name, Mary Celeste. In October 1869, the ship was seized by Haynes's creditors and sold to a New York consortium headed by James H. Winchester. During the next three years, the composition of this consortium changed several times, although Winchester retained at least a half share throughout. No record of Mary Celeste's trading activities during this period have been found. Early in 1872, the ship underwent a major refit, costing $10,000, which enlarged her considerably. Her length was increased to 103 feet, her breadth to 25.7 feet, and her depth to 16.2 feet. In October 1872, Captain Benjamin took command of Mary Celeste for her first voyage following her extensive New York refit, which was to take her to Genoa in Italy. He arranged for his wife and infant daughter to accompany him, while his school-aged son was left at home in the care of his grandmother. Briggs chose the crew for this voyage with care. On October 20th, 1872, Briggs arrived at Pier 50 on the East River in New York City to supervise the loading of the ship's cargo of 1,701 barrels of alcohol. His wife and infant daughter joined him a week later. On Sunday, November 3rd, Briggs wrote to his mother to say that he intended to leave on Tuesday, adding that, Our vessel is in beautiful trim, and I hope we shall have a fine passage. On Tuesday morning, November 5th, Mary Celeste left Pier 50 with Briggs, his wife and daughter, and seven crew members, and moved into New York Harbor. The weather was uncertain, and Briggs decided to wait for better conditions. He anchored the ship just off Staten Island, where Sarah used the delay to send a final letter to her mother-in-law. Tell Arthur, she wrote, I make great dependence on the letters I shall get from him and will try to remember anything that happens on the voyage, which he would be pleased to hear. The weather eased two days later, and Mary Celeste left the harbor and entered the Atlantic. While Mary Celeste prepared to sail, the Canadian brigantine De Gratia lay nearby in Hoboken, New Jersey, awaiting a cargo of petroleum destined for Genoa via Gibraltar. Captain David Morehouse and first mate Oliver DeVoe were Nova Scotians, both highly experienced and respected seamen. Captains Briggs and Morehouse shared common interests, and some writers think it likely that they knew each other, if only casually. Some accounts assert that they were close friends who dined together on the evening before Mary Celeste's departure, but the evidence for this is limited to a recollection by Morehouse's widow 50 years after the event. 
de Gratia departed for Gibraltar on November 15th, following the same general route eight days after Mary Celeste. De Gratia had reached a position of midway between the Azores and the coast of Portugal at about 1 p.m. On Wednesday, December 4th, 1872, land time. Thursday, December 5th, sea time. Captain Morehouse came on deck and the helmsman reported a vessel heading unsteadily towards De Gratia at a distance of about six miles. The ship's erratic movements and the odd set of her sails led Morehouse to suspect that something was wrong. As the vessel drew close, he could see nobody on deck, and he received no reply to his signals, so he sent Devoe and second mate John Wright in a ship's boat to investigate. The pair established that this was the Mary Celeste by the name on her stern. They then climbed aboard and found the ship deserted. The sails were partly set and in a poor condition, some missing altogether, and much of the rigging was damaged, with ropes hanging loosely over the sides. The main hatch cover was secure, but the fore and lazarette hatches were open, their covers beside them on the deck. The ship's single lifeboat was a small yawl that had apparently been stowed across the main hatch, but it was missing, while the binnacle housing the ship's compass had shifted from its place and its glass cover was broken. There was about 3.5 feet of water in the hold, a significant but not alarming amount for a ship of this size. A makeshift sounding rod, a device for measuring the amount of water in the hold, was found abandoned on the deck. They found the ship's daily log in the mate's cabin, and its final entry was dated at 8 a.m. on November 25th, nine days earlier. It recorded Mary Celeste's position then as off Santa Maria Island in the Azores, nearly 400 nautical miles from the point where De Gratia encountered her. DeVoe saw that the cabin interiors were wet and untidy from water that had entered through doorways and skylights, but were otherwise in reasonable order. He found personal items scattered about Briggs's cabin, including a sheathed sword under the bed. But most of the ship's papers were missing, along with the captain's navigational instruments. Galley equipment was neatly stowed away. There was no food prepared or under preparation, but there were ample provisions in the stores. There were no obvious signs of fire or violence, the evidence indicated an orderly departure from the ship by means of the missing lifeboat. DeVoe returned to report these findings to Morehouse, who decided to bring the derelict into Gibraltar, 600 nautical miles away. Under maritime law, a salvor could expect a substantial share of the combined value of rescued vessel and cargo, the exact award depending on the degree of danger inherent in the salvaging. Morehouse divided De Gratia's crew of eight between the two vessels, sending DeVoe and two experienced seamen to Mary Celeste, while he and four others remained on De Gratia. The weather was relatively calm for most of the way to Gibraltar, but each ship was seriously undercrewed and progress was slow. De Gratia reached Gibraltar on December 12th. Mary Celeste had encountered fog and arrived on the following morning. She was immediately impounded by the Vice Admiralty Court to prepare for salvage hearings. DeVoe wrote to his wife that the ordeal of bringing the ship in was such that I can hardly tell what I am made of, but I do not care so long as I got in safe. I shall be well paid for the Mary Celeste. Various theories have emerged over the years to explain the disappearance. Piracy. Some speculated that pirates attacked the ship but no evidence of a struggle or damage supporting this theory was found. Mutiny. It was considered whether the crew mutinied against Captain Briggs, but there was no evidence of a mutiny, and Briggs was known as a capable and respected captain. Natural phenomenon. Theories involving water spouts, sea quakes, or other natural phenomena causing panic among the crew have been suggested, but none were substantiated. Insurance fraud. Some proposed that the crew intentionally abandoned ship for insurance reasons, but investigations found no evidence supporting this claim. Ultimately, despite extensive investigations and inquiries, the fate of the crew of the Mary Celeste remains an unsolved mystery. The ship's disappearance continues to intrigue historians, sparking endless speculation and theories about what might have happened on that fateful voyage.